Good afternoon. Good afternoon. For those who don't know me, my name is Craig Clemenson, and it's my honor to, to welcome Mr. Carson, Dr. Carson, Secretary Carson, to, to HUD. And he's the 17th Secretary of HUD. I know that we're all looking forward to his leadership. So without any further ado, I am going to, to ask Secretary Carson and Mrs. Carson to walk out onto the floor. Let's give them a big round of applause. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Please, please be seated. We appreciate your, uh, your honoring us this way. And, um, you know, I, I just found out about this, so I prepared a little speech. No, no, I did not. <laughs> not going to take away. Just wanted to come up and say thank you for your service and your dedication to making a big difference. We know that you're gonna be doing even more and we're really excited about working with, well, he's really, I'm excited just because you're doing it. So thank you so much and I'm gonna leave it to the secretary now. Thank you. <laughs> well, I must say it's really quite uh, a new exciting adventure for me uh, coming to do this. I've already had an opportunity to meet a large number of people, and uh, it has made me even more enthusiastic uh, seeing how dedicated they are to the purposes of this organization. You know, early on in my life, the only thing I ever wanted to do was be a doctor. I loved everything that had to do with medicine. I even liked going to the doctor's office. So. <laughs> tells you I was a strange kid, you know. I would gladly sacrifice a shot just so I could smell the alcohol swabs. But, uh, <laughs> and going to the hospital was like the best thing in the world because, uh, you know, we were our medical assistants and you'd have to wait a long time sometimes before you could see the doctor. And sometimes it was the intern or the resident. It didn't matter to me though. Some people get all upset and they say, my time's important too. Why am I waiting all this time? I would just sit out in the hallway and listen to the PA system. Dr. Jones, Dr. Jones to the emergency room, Dr. Johnson to the clinic. They sounded so important. And I'd be thinking, one day they'll be saying, Dr. Carson, Dr. Carson. But of course, they have beepers now. But, uh, <laughs> but it, it was that dream, you know, that, that pushed me sometimes, particularly when the going was tough. And it certainly was tough, you know, when my parents got divorced, I was very young. And, you know, my mother only had a third grade education. And uh, we had to move in with relatives. So I certainly had an opportunity to know what it was like not to, to have a nice home or to have any home at all. And she worked so hard, two, three jobs at a time, she didn't like the idea of being dependent. And her friends were always saying, you got two boys, you don't have to work. But she says, yes, I do, I have to work. And she always made it clear to us how much of our future was within our own hands, no matter what anybody else said. And she made it clear that we knew that the person who had the most to do with what happened to you is you. But we also, along the way, appreciated very much help. And there were always people around who were willing to help, in including many of the people who employed her. Uh, you know, she was a domestic. She cleaned their homes. But, you know, they would give her things. They would give her, you know, clothing for us. They, all kinds of things. And those things were very much appreciated. And it's one of the reasons that I feel it's so important to be able to give back. 
and to be able to do things for other people. You know, my whole medical career was about helping people, trying to save lives, trying to give people quality of life. And I must admit, a few years ago, I decided it was time to retire. I was very much looking forward to retiring and relaxing, you know. I had it all planned out. I was going to retire when I turned 61. And why was I going to do that? Because someone told me that neurosurgeons die early. And um, I didn't believe it, so I wrote down the name of the last 10 neurosurgeons that I knew who died, calculated the average age of death, and it was 61. So, <laughs> so I said, if I'm not dead, I'm retiring. I turn 61. <laughs> um, but I guess the Lord had a, a little different idea. But, but interestingly enough, I started out as an adult neurosurgeon. But I very quickly learned that no matter how good an operation you did on those chronic back pain patients, they never got any better until they got their settlement. Whereas, <laughs> whereas with the kids, you know, what you see is what you get. You know, when they felt good, you know they felt good. When they felt bad, you know they felt bad. And, uh, you know, with a kid, you can operate for 10, 12, 18, 20 hours. And if you're successful, your reward may be 50, 60, 70, 80 years of life. Whereas with an old geezer, you spend all that time operating and they die in five years or something else. So I'd like to get a big return on my investment. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I like old people. <laughs> I'm one of them now. Anyway, <laughs> but no, seriously, it is such a privilege and such an honor to be able to work with all of you. And one of the things that really impressed me as I was talking to the landing team here and they were talking about the people here that they've gotten to know and had an opportunity to work with and how dedicated they were to the mission of really helping the downtrodden, helping the people in our society to be able to climb the ladder. Because to me, that really is what it's all about. It's about the American dream, the ability to move up that ladder the ability to make a difference in the lives of our fellow Americans, recognizing how much innate potential there is in them. And there's a great intersection, actually, between medicine and the work of this department. And I'm not just talking about, you know, lead hazards and molds. In fact, my very first meeting as Secretary of HUD was with the Lead Hazard Environmental Health Group. Uh, obviously, that's very important, but that's not where the intersection ends. I think about all the lessons that I learned from my patients. For instance, there was one little girl from the state of Connecticut, and bright, beautiful young lady, in the third grade, she was on the swing, fell off the swing, had a grand mal seizure. And nobody got too concerned. They said, it's a post-traumatic seizure, not a problem. But the next week, she had two seizures. And the next week, three seizures. And then three a day, 10 a day, 30 a day, 60 a day. The doctors in Connecticut didn't know what to do. They sent her to the doctors in New York. They didn't know what to do. They sent her to the doctors in Boston. They didn't know what to do, but there was an older doctor there. He says, she reminds me of someone with Rasmussen's encephalitis. And he says, with that disease, the seizures get worse and worse no matter what you do. And eventually, she'll have to be put into an institution. And eventually, she'll die. Well, the parents were devastated. 
They're beautiful. They're a precious little girl. Nothing anyone could do. An institution, die. But the mother was one of those people who would never give up, never say die. And she went to the library and she read everything she could about seizures and epilepsy and encephalitis. And she discovered some of the work we were doing at Hopkins with a procedure called cerebral hemispherectomy, where we take out half the brain in children to stop intractable seizures. And they brought her for an evaluation. And we evaluated her and felt that she was a candidate for that operation. But when I explained to the parents the risk of surgery, that she might be paralyzed, she might not be able to speak, she might die. They said, thank you, doctor. But no thanks. Because we couldn't live with ourselves if she was in a coma or she died and we never even had a chance to say goodbye. So they took the little girl, seizures and all, back home to Connecticut. That Christmas, she was in a play, and while she was on the stage, she had a grand mal seizure. Fell down, arms and legs jerking, eyes rolled back, foaming at the mouth, incontinent of urine. That was the straw that broke the camel's back. They brought her back. They wanted the operation. I performed the operation, took out the left half of her brain. Everything went smoothly, except for one thing. She didn't wake up. She remained in a coma. A day, two days, three days, still in a coma. Every time I would go in the room, the parents were by the side of the bed, grieving and regretting their decision. I really felt for them. And she used to love Mr. Rogers. So they would play tapes of Mr. Rogers singing and saying poetry and what have you. Two weeks had gone by, didn't wake her up. Three weeks went by. Mr. Rogers actually heard about her. Came to Johns Hopkins with all of his puppets to her bedside to try to wake her up. Didn't wake her up. Four weeks went by, still in a coma. It was 2 a.m. in the morning. Dad was laying on a cot next to her bed. And she said, Daddy, my nose itches. He was so shocked. He jumped up. He was so excited. He ran out in the hallway. She talked. She talked. Only had on his underpants. Everybody came out. <laughs> Everybody came out to see what all the commotion was. That was the beginning of a rapid recovery for that little girl. And pretty soon she was walking and she was talking. She was not having seizures, and it was time to go back to school. But now they were worried. She was missing the left half of her brain, the side that allows you to calculate, to do math. They said she'll never be able to achieve in school. But that little girl was so determined. She worked so hard that she had the highest math score in her class with half of a brain. And I frequently, when I talk to young people about that story, I say, can you imagine what you could do with a whole brain and some concentration? And I believe that w there is so much potential. There is so much that we're going to be able to accomplish. One of the first jobs that I want to do as secretary is listen, is listen to people across this country. We're gonna go on a listening tour. We're gonna see what works and what doesn't work. And we're going to analyze why things work and why they don't work. I find that to be very effective. It has been very effective for me throughout my medical career. You can learn from mistakes just like you can learn from triumphs. I think back to Walter Dandy, a famous neurosurgeon at Johns Hopkins many decades ago, the first one to do all kinds of things. First one to operate on the posterior fossa. People said you can't operate on that part back there because it's small and restrictive and the tissue will swell and the patient will die. But Dandy operated on somebody with a lesion in the posterior fossa. And the tissue did swell, and the patient did die. 
and another, and they died, and another, and they died. The first 13 all died. I can't even imagine what he said to the 14th patient. They asked how the others did. Probably said nobody's complaining, you know. <laughs> but the fact of the matter is, he persisted. He learned. And now we're able to do posterior fossa operations routinely and safely. And what does that say about being able to observe and being able to learn from what has happened, be it good or be it bad? And the way I look at it, all the things that have happened leading up to this point are things from which we can learn, are stepping stones to allow us to get to that next place in our society. You know, I've had the privilege of visiting 58 different countries. And I got to tell you, no matter what anybody says, we are extraordinarily lucky to live in this country, the United States of America. And I think, I think we have a duty to do everything we can to enhance it for the next generation. We have a duty to reject the purveyors of division and hatred that exists out there. We have a duty to enhance fairness for everyone. And one of the things that you will notice in this department under my leadership is that there will be a very big emphasis on fairness for everybody. Everything that we do, every policy, no favorites for anybody, no extras for anybody, but complete fairness for everybody. Because that was really what the founders of this nation had in mind. And if you read the Constitution, it becomes very clear that that was the goal. People could do whatever they wanted as long as what you wanted to do didn't interfere with me and with what I, what I wanted to. That's the way I think we should do things. Doesn't mean that we are not going to be extremely vigilant when it comes to the laws of our land extremely vigilant in terms of enforcing them. But it does mean that we recognize that when we treat people fairly, the need to regulate their lives and to try to force people to do things becomes much, much smaller. Because people don't feel that they're being treated unjustly. And therefore, they're not looking for a way around the situation. And I don't see any reason why we can't lead that effort in this department. It is extremely well situated on a platform that is visible to all that will give us the opportunity to show not only people in this country, but people in the world what it means to care about your fellow man, what it means to look after their rights, what it means to understand that every one of the children born in our nation is a treasure and is someone for us to develop. And if we develop that potential, they become part of the engine and not part of the load. And every human being, regardless of their ethnicities or their background, they have a brain, the human brain. There is nothing in this universe that even begins to compare with the human brain. 
and what it is capable of. Billions and billions of neurons, hundreds of billions of interconnections. It remembers everything you've ever seen, everything you've ever heard. I could take the oldest person here, make a little hole right here on the side of the head, <laughs> and put some depth electrodes into their hippocampus and stimulate, and they would be able to recite back to you verbatim a book they read 60 years ago. It's all there. It doesn't go away. You just have to learn how to recall it, but that's what your brain is capable. Can process more than two million bits of information per second. You can't overload it. Have you ever heard people say, don't do all that, you'll overload your brain? You can't overload the human brain. <laughs> if you learned one new fact every second, it would take you more than three million years to challenge the capacity of your brain. Can't be done. So we need to concentrate a little less on what we can't do and a little more on what we can do. After all, this is America. This used to be known as the can-do society. Not the what-can-you-do-for-me society, but the can-do society. And there is a lot that we can do if we are simply willing to reach outside of ourselves and recognize that each person, all of our fellow men, all of our fellow Americans, we are one. It's called the United States of America. Think about that the next time you want to be mean to somebody because there's no reason to do it. And go to Ellis Island one of these days, if you haven't been there, and go through that museum on Ellis Island. And look at the pictures of all those people who are hanging up there from every part of the world, many of them carrying all their earthly belongings in their two hands, not knowing what this country held for them. Look at the determination in their eyes People who work not five days a week, but six or seven days a week. Not eight hours a day, but 10, 12, 16 hours a day. No such thing as a minimum wage. They work not for themselves, but for their sons and their daughters and their grandsons and their granddaughters that they might have an opportunity in this land. That's what America is about a land of dreams and opportunity. There were other immigrants who came here in the bottom of slave ships, worked even longer, even harder for less. But they too had a dream that one day their sons, daughters, grandsons, granddaughters, great-grandsons, great-granddaughters might pursue prosperity and happiness in this land. And do you know of all the nations in the world, this one, the United States of America, is the only one big enough and great enough to allow all those people to realize their dream. And this is our, our opportunity to enhance that dream. And I just want to close before I give you an opportunity to ask some questions with my philosophy for success in life. It's called Think Big. Each one of those letters means something special. The T is for talent, which God gave to every single person, not just the ability to sing and dance and throw a ball, but intellectual talent. That's what distinguishes us from the rest of creation. The H is for honesty. Lead a clean and honest life. You don't put skeletons in the closet, they can't come back out to haunt you. The I is for insight. 
comes from listening to people who've already gone where you're trying to go. Learn from their triumphs. Learn from their mistakes. The end is for nice. Be nice to people. Because once they get over their suspicion of why you're being nice, they'll be nice to you. <laughs> and you can get so much more done when you're being nice and they're being nice. And can we all just take the niceness pledge? Just raise your hand right where you are. Everybody raise your hand. If the person next to you doesn't have their hand up, you may kick them. <laughs> okay. <laughs> now, okay, you can put your hands up. Now, now, what did you just pledge to do? Be nice to every single person you encounter for one week. That includes your spouse. Everybody for one week. Now, what does that mean? That means no talking about people behind their backs for a week. Now, some people will stroke out. I understand that. Okay. It means you see somebody struggling, you're going to help them. Men, it means we're opening the doors for the ladies and holding their chairs for them. Okay. Ladies, it means you're not cursing them out when they do that. Okay. There's only one spot on the elevator you're letting somebody else get on. And when you're on the elevator, don't act like you never saw the numbers change before. Speak to people. <laughs> you know, they might stroke out, but speak to them. Just say hello to people on the elevator. You're going to get your car. The parking lot is crowded. You see three people following you in their car because they want your spot. When you get in the car, don't open the glove box and just just get out of the spot and let them have it. You know, just, you know. Don't revel in your power. But you know what? What are you doing? You're thinking about others first. That's all. Just thinking about other people first. We can do that. This is America. We're not like everybody else. We need to think about that. We don't have to be like everybody else. Let them be like us. The K is for knowledge, which is the mechanism for making yourself more valuable. And the B is for books which is the best mechanism for getting that knowledge. Some people say, I don't need to read books. I can learn everything I need to learn by watching DVDs and videos. That's like saying you can develop your muscles by watching somebody else lift weights. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. But you exercise your mind, it works much better for you. The second I is for in-depth learning, learning for the sake of knowledge and understanding, as opposed to superficial learning, which is what a lot of people do, to cram, cram, cram before a test. Sometimes they do okay, and three weeks later they know nothing. We can do better than that. And the last letter, G, is for God. You know, we live in a nation where a lot of people are trying to get rid of God. I think that is a big mistake. You know, think about the fact that our founding document, the Declaration of Independence, talks about certain inalienable rights given to us by our creator, AKA God. The Pledge of Allegiance to that flag says we are one nation under God. Every coin in our pocket, every bill in our wallet says, in God we trust. On the walls of many of the courts in our land, it says, in God we trust. So if it's in our founding document, it's in our pledge, it's in our courts, and it's on our money, but we're not supposed to talk about it, what in the world is that? In medicine, we call it schizophrenia. <laughs> and doesn't that explain a lot of what's going on in our society? And it is okay to live by godly principles. 
of loving your fellow man, caring about your neighbor, developing your God-given talents to the utmost so that you can be valuable to the people around you, having values and principles that govern your life. And if we do that, we truly will have one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Now, we have an opportunity for a few questions, and then uh, if anybody wants to uh, take a picture or whatever, I'll be around for a few minutes. Uh, welcome to HUD, Secretary Thank you. Carson. My name is Avery Jackson, and I work in Fair Housing and Equal Opportunity. I'm an investigator there. Um, I was really happy to hear you say that we'll be vigilant um, in enforcing the law because one of the things we're tasked with doing is enforcing the Civil Rights Act of 1968, um, which you know is also the Fair yes. Housing Act. Um, so I guess I'd like to hear a little more about your, div uh, your um, plans for the division of fair housing um, and equal opportunity overall and more generally um, how you plan to further civil rights while you're here at HUD. Thank you. Well, I think, uh, good question. Uh, thank you. I'm going to be doing it just the same way you are. And that is, you know, watching to see what people are doing. And uh, more importantly, listening to what people have to say. There's always a lot of different perspectives. And one of the things that I have found is when you have divergent perspectives, if you can get those people to sit down and talk to each other, they will frequently be able to come up with extremely good solutions. I believe in always giving the first pass to the people who are actually involved, as opposed to imposing upon them from above. Because when you impose things on people, particularly people in America who tend to be independent, they tend to resist just out of principle, just out of general principle. Whereas when they are involved themselves, this is something I learned from my mother. She only had a third grade education, but she's an extremely wise person. And for my brother and me, the rules of the house, she always had us sit down and make them up. Therefore, we couldn't really complain about them. <laughs> and uh, it worked pretty good, I got to admit. We had a very smooth running house, no matter all the chaos that was going on outside because of that ruling. Another question. That's a quiet group. My goodness gracious. <laughs> Hi, Dr. Carson. Hi. Uh, my name is Jay Martin. I work at FHA front office and in manufactured housing. And uh, I'm interested in hearing about how you talk about wanting public-private partnerships. For example, in FHA, we uh, do a lot of that with both the mortgage market and my original office manufactured housing. So can you talk a little bit about that? Well, you know, interestingly enough, the problems that plague us, you know, homelessness, homelessness inadequate numbers of affordable housing units, um, you know, these are, these are things that affect our entire society. And I've found that there are enormous numbers of people out there, people of goodwill, who are quite willing to get involved in helping to solve these problems. We don't necessarily have to always depend on the government 
and government financing. There's a lot more money outside of government than there is inside of government. Although there are some people who would like to change that. But anyway, I won't get into that. Um, providing opportunities that are win-win situations. That's how we get more of the private sector involved in the governmental programs. I remember when I was in college and uh, I would come uh, back to Detroit in the summertime I was, I was at Yale and uh, they'd be saying, there's not gonna be any jobs this summer uh, because of the economy and Ford and General Motors and Chrysler were doing terrible and Toyota was doing great and Nissan was doing well, which they called it back in those days. And no one's going to get a job, but I always got a job because I didn't do what everybody else did, look at the want ads or go with the want posters. I would just get on the bus and I would ride until I saw a bunch of small businesses and I'd get off the bus and go knock on the door and say, hello, my name is Ben Carson. I'm a student at Yale. I'm looking for a summer job. Guess what? I would get a job because a lot of the small businesses didn't have an advertising budget, but if you showed up on their doorstep, of course they had a job for you. It was great. But one summer that didn't even work. So uh, I remember when I was interviewing for Yale, I did a regional interview at the Young and Rubicon advertising firm. So I went to the Young and Rubicon building and I got on the executive elevator, went up to the penthouse, waited for the secretary to turn her back. I went into the guy's office and he said, Benjamin, how are you? How are things at Yale? And I said, things are great, but I'm home for the summer. I can't find a job. He said, did you, did you try our personnel department? I said, yeah, they're not hiring any students this summer. He picked up the phone, called the personnel director, says, there's a young man by the name of Ben Carson on the way down there, give him a job. So I had a job that summer too. A little untraditional, out of the box, but it worked. But I was working one summer for the highway department cleanup crew. I was a supervisor for the cleanup crews. And you know, these guys you see with the big plastic bags going along the highway picking up trash. And the only problem was they didn't really want to do it. And I didn't want to be paid if they weren't doing their job. So I got the guys together and I said, look guys, you don't want to be picking up trash in the hot sun, right? They said, you got that right. I said, okay. I said, I have an idea. I said, why don't we start at 6 a.m. in the morning? They said, 6 a.m., are you crazy? What are they teaching you at that fancy school? I said, no, hear me out. At 6 a.m., it's cool, and you can work efficiently. And your job is to pick up 100 bags of garbage, and you have eight hours to do it. But here's the deal. I'll pay you for eight hours, even if you do it in seven hours. I'll pay you for eight hours if you do it in six hours. I'll pay you for eight hours no matter what amount of time it takes you to do it. You have never seen people work like this before. <laughs> I mean, by 8 a.m., they would have 200 bags, whole stretches of highway. And the people who ran the, the uh, program were flabbergasted. And they would say, Carson's crews are amazing, but we never see them. But, uh, <laughs> but it was a win-win situation. And, and that's, that's what we have to do with these public-private partnerships. Even though people have good hearts and they want to do things for their fellow man, we are, are smart enough to craft programs that work, that allow them to make a profit, and that also accomplish the goals that we are doing. That's how America went from nowhere to the pinnacle of the world in record time. We took advantage of the entrepreneurial spirit. We created an atmosphere that encourages entrepreneurial risk taking and capital investment. And as we create that same environment, we will see that same natural, innovative spirit that made America into a great nation. Any other questions? One more question. 
Good afternoon, Secretary Carson. Hi. Mine is not a question, but an observation. I think with the new administration, federal employees are sometimes a little afraid of um, what, new, what the new administration bring to the agency. But for me, I would like to just thank you because I was one of those people who was afraid of what the new administration would bring to HUD. But I think that your um, address to us have addressed those uncertainties. You have made me very comfortable with being under your leadership. And I, for one, just want to thank you. I really appreciate everything you said. And you've encouraged me to think big. And you have encouraged me to try to reach those standards that you have for yourself and for HUD. And I just wanted to say thank you. I really appreciate your speech. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Well, I appreciate that sentiment. And, you know, I am very much looking forward to a tremendous time here, very harmonious with us working together. I hope the different departments, different divisions here will work across the aisle. Make sure that you get to know each other. The more we know each other, the more effective we're going to be as an organization. And uh, we will get together periodically, talk about what's going on. You're going to be able to see the incredible influence that you're having on the policies of this nation. Thank you all so much.